Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us again today. I want to start, as usual, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, I can tell you that there have been 13,763 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 136 from yesterday. A total of 81 people last night were in intensive care with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of one since yesterday. In terms of the numbers in hospital, I want to give a little bit more context to this figure today. Um, as of last night, a total of 1,618 patients were in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is an increase of 165 from yesterday. However, uh, and this point I want to stress, that increase is entirely in suspected cases. The number of confirmed cases is 1,131, and that is a decrease of 14. Uh, so we're exploring uh, this rise in suspected cases further. Uh, but as you know, all people over 70 admitted to hospital are now being tested even if they don't have COVID symptoms. So it may uh, therefore be that until a test result is known, some health boards are automatically counting these patients as suspected, even if they don't have symptoms of the virus. So I wanted to say that today to uh, just alert you to the fact that this is something we're investigating further, having seen these figures today, uh, but also to say to you at this stage, uh, I'd caution against having any undue concern about the hospital figure that I have reported to you today. I'm also able to confirm uh, that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,167 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised for the virus have now been able to leave hospital, and I'm sure all of us wish them well. Uh, unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 50 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,912. Uh, of course, tomorrow we will have the latest National Records of Scotland uh, publication, which will include uh, deaths, not just those confirmed through a test, but also those that are presumed uh, to be related to the virus. And as always, I want to stress that behind each of these statistics is a unique and irreplaceable human being whose loss right now is a source of deep grief to many. And I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus and to say that I'm sure everybody across the whole country is thinking of you. I also want to thank, again, our health and care workers. All of us are enormously grateful to you for the work that you're doing right now. Uh, today, the 12th of May, is the International Day of the Nurse. Uh, myself and the Chief Medical Officer are joined today by the Chief Nursing Officer, Fiona McQueen, and I want today to say an extra special thank you to all of Scotland's nurses. The past few weeks have demonstrated yet again just how much all of us owe to your compassion, your dedication and your expertise. From the bottom of my heart, thank you to all of you. Now, I have three issues I want to briefly update on today. The first relates to the social care sector, which, of course, is being placed under immense pressure by this virus. The Scottish Government is working hard to support the sector in every way we can. Uh, we have, for example, expanded testing in care homes. We are also and have been for some time ensuring that any care home with an urgent need for personal protective equipment that can't be sourced through normal uh, routes can receive it from our national stockpile of PPE. And today I can confirm that we are making an additional £50 million available to help meet extra costs in the care sector that have been incurred as a result of COVID-19. The funding will be allocated across every local authority area in the country and it will cover both care home services and care at home services. And it will help to ensure that care services around the country can cope with the immense pressures that they are facing at this time. The second issue uh, I want to update on is to tell you that we are setting aside £31 million to extend eligibility to the Small Business Grant Scheme. The extension applies to premises which qualified for charitable or sports rates relief, but which would otherwise, if they hadn't qualified for those reliefs, have been eligible for the Small Business Bonus. 
Charities occupying uh, these properties can now receive small business grants. Uh, these grants, as you may recall, are worth £10,000 for the first property and £7,500 for any subsequent property owned by the same organisation. Uh, we know that many charities which run small premises like day centres, offices or workshops have been really hard hit by a loss of revenue during the pandemic. Uh, many of these charities, which include providers of health and care services, are still providing vital support to those who need it. So extending the Small Business Grant Scheme is one way in which we can help them at a time when the help they provide is more important than ever. The final point I want to make today is that, as I have emphasised over the past couple of days, the lockdown restrictions remain in place for Scotland. And so it's maybe worth stressing what this currently means in relation to employers and employees. I know that the UK government published guidance for businesses yesterday. Uh, I want to stress that that guidance is not yet operational in Scotland, since at this stage we are not currently encouraging more people to go back to work. I would ask instead that all employers follow Scottish Government guidance. I'm very grateful for the fact that the vast majority of employers have been so responsible throughout this crisis. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, most will do this and will not urge workers to come back to work prematurely. And for employees, I would remind you that if you think your working conditions are unsafe, you have rights under employment legislation. If you have a trade union in your workplace and you have concerns about your working conditions, you should also uh, be able to talk to them. The Scottish Government is working with employers and with trade unions to develop guidance on safe workplaces, which has the confidence of businesses and workers. We have therefore established working groups across 14 sectors to consider how quickly and in what manner we can start to return to work. Early priorities, as I've stated before, are the retail, manufacturing and construction sectors. However, the working groups also cover sectors such as tourism, energy, finance and food and drink. We believe that this partnership approach is the right and responsible way to proceed. It will allow businesses to reopen when they can safely do so, and we all want that to be as soon as possible and it will hopefully provide employers, workers and the wider public with the vital reassurance that reopening will not be putting your health at unnecessary risk. Uh, finally, I want to restate today what the lockdown restrictions mean for all of us. Our fundamental advice in Scotland remains unchanged. Please stay at home, except for essential work that can't be done at home, for buying food uh, or accessing medicines or exercising. You can, of course, now go for walks, runs, bike rides more than once a day if you want to. But when you are out, please stay more than two metres from other people and don't meet up with people from other households. Wear a face covering if you are in a shop or on public transport and isolate completely if you or someone in your household has symptoms. As I say every day, um, because it's true, I know these restrictions are very hard and they get tougher to comply with with every single day that passes. But we are doing it for a reason, uh, because by complying with these restrictions now, we will all come out of lockdown sooner and we will do so in a way that minimises uh, the number of lives that are lost to this horrible virus. So please stick with these restrictions for now, uh, because that is the way that we will continue, as we have been doing, to slow the spread of the virus. It's how we will continue to protect the NHS. And as I said a moment ago, it is how we will save lives. So my thanks again to all of you for your cooperation so far. Uh, I'm now going to ask the Chief Nursing Officer on uh, this International Day of the Nurse uh, to say a few words before I hand over to the Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. So last year, when the World Health Organisation designated this year as the International Year of the Nurse, they did it to highlight the roles that nurses have right across the countries. And in Scotland, our nurses work across many settings, from our most remote, remote islands to our, our densely populated cities. They are involved in, in public health and dedicate their, their careers to you know, improving the nation's well-being and delivering care. So our health visitors and our family nurses are supporting families, in particular through this difficult time, supporting the delivery of life-saving immunisations and in making sure that the, our young people have, have the best possible start. Similarly, in our more traditional 
uh, thoughts of what nurses do within our hospitals, within our intensive care units, and in particular at this time with COVID, then we see the, um, the professionalism and the dedication that nurses have right across all of our settings. We had planned many events. We had planned uh, celebrations, social gatherings, uh, recognition of the professional contribution across the country uh, throughout this year, but in particular focusing in and around uh, May the 12th. And instead of, of having our social events and our celebrations, what nurses have done is what I think nurses do all of the time. Put their uniform on, put their patients first, the embodiment of professionalism, I think, is such a glowing recognition of the care and the dedication of nurses that we can do no more to celebrate that than any tea party or, or celebration to mark the professionalism of nurses. So to each and every nurse who is going through challenging times, uh, just as the rest of the population are being asked to recognise lockdown, we know that nurses rely heavily on families and friends for support. We know it can be a challenging time, and that's partly why the Scottish Government has launched the, the online resources for wellbeing, and I would encourage everyone to, to use that. But nurses rely on their families and their friends and are missing them during this lockdown period. We want to make sure that our nurses can do their very best in this protected NHS the way that we have asked our country to do by following our rules. They're going to be involved in contact tracing with our test, trace and isolate. They're going to be involved and they currently are giving incredibly specialist infection prevention and control advice that keeps our NHS safe as well as our community teams who are out supporting our shielded patients, delivering care in their homes whilst they can't get out, as well as our traditional community nursing services. So nurses across Scotland today and right around the clock for 365 days a year are doing their job professionally and ably and competently. To all of you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you do every single day to, to do it within this difficult time. What I'm asking the country to do, to support our nurses, to say thank you to our nurses and to support our NHS, is to remember to follow the rules. Stay at home, only go out if it's essential. And if you are going out, remember in respecting other essential workers such as shop workers, you need to socially distance when you are out for that essential purpose. So thank you to all of our nurses and please people of Scotland, thank and recognise the support and the amazing work that our nurses do by staying at home and following our guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And I'll hand over now to the CMO to say a few words. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I want to briefly return to a theme today that I've spoken about before. Uh, one of the important reasons why people can, can and should leave their homes is for medical reasons. That might be to collect medicines, it might be to receive routine vaccination from one of the national programmes, or to receive medical attention, whether that be in a hospital or a GP practice. The service might look different just now, but it's still open for issues that need attention. I'm beginning to see some encouraging signs that people are doing this. We often talk about the direct harm that COVID-19 is having in the population, but this indirect harm as a consequence of our current situation is equally important. During the week ending the 3rd of May, there were over 1,500 referrals with an urgent suspicion of cancer in Scotland. Whilst this is still not back to the levels that we would expect based on previous year's data, it represents a 40% increase from the previous week, and it's over double the figure that I reported to you one month ago. When I speak to colleagues in general practice, they tell me that there are more people coming forward to seek help and conducting more face-to-face -face consultations, but they do remain concerned. People are presenting later in the course of their symptoms, having decided to hold off for a while before going to see someone about it. So I want to repeat my earlier message to you. Please, if you have symptoms you're worried about, speak to your clinicians about these. General practice is there for you and remains ready and open to help you. Many of these worries will be easily dealt with, but some will need more attention or investigation. So if you have symptoms like, for instance, coughing blood, or passing blood when you go to the toilet, if you've had a change in your bowel habit or unexplained weight loss, or if you've found a new lump, please don't ignore them. Please don't wait off. Contact your GP surgery and explain that you have an urgent symptom that you need to speak to your doctor about. This isn't being unreasonable. 
is not putting inappropriate pressure in the service. This is something that I know your clinicians will want to see and help you with. If it was urgent before COVID-19, it remains urgent now. I want to emphasise again that your NHS remains open and ready to help you, and it's time to seek help if you're worried about symptoms like these just now. OK, thank you, uh, Gregor. I will move now to questions as usual. My first question today comes from Andrew Kerr from the BBC. spoke about the deaths of three grandparents in the same family within a month, and that should make us reflect and listen to the advice on lockdown. Given that outbreak started at a family party held in the early March when government advice was still to go about our business as usual, has it given you cause to reflect on the scientific advice you were receiving about lockdown, and did you have the power to lock down earlier? And just to the CMO, given the possible cost of a later lockdown, do you now wish the First Minister had been given different advice? Um, I'll hand over to CMO in a moment. Um, I think everybody should uh, take it as read that on a daily basis I you know, question the decisions we're taking, um, give a lot of thought uh, to the decisions we're taking because I'm anxious that we get those decisions as right as possible. I don't have the uh, benefit of 2020 hindsight. And, you know, I, I reflect on the fact that in the last few days alone, standing at this podium, I've been asked to comment on expert opinion at, you know, opposite ends of a spectrum. So today, um, being asked to comment on uh, expert opinion that says if we'd locked down earlier, things would have been different. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was asked to comment on a, an expert opinion that said there's no point at all to lockdown because uh, it just delays the inevitable. And as we go through this pandemic, the same number of people will be affected regardless of, of what we do. I have to take the best decisions I uh, take uh, based on the evidence and the advice we have at the time. That's what I have done throughout this and it is what uh, I will continue to do. Yes, I, I question and apply a lot of self-scrutiny to these decisions as, as well as the very legitimate scrutiny that comes from other sources. Um, and in due course, every single country will look back and ask itself questions um, and have questions asked of it about what it did when and whether that was right or wrong or whether things could have been done differently. As I say, we don't have the, the benefit of, of hindsight. What I have to focus on more than anything, though, is making sure that we continue to get the decisions uh, right, uh, because we are not through this yet. And there are many decisions uh, that lie ahead of us. There are no certainties in any of this, uh, but we have to continue to make the right judgments. I, uh, again, you know, I'm not saying this in any critical way. It's part of the, the legitimate scrutiny. But you know, yesterday, questions uh, are, are raised about should we have a lockdown earlier? Uh, but I'm also facing questions about why we're not lifting the lockdown sooner than we are. So these are these are difficult and complex judgments, and we have to make them on the best advice and evidence and in the best way possible. One of the things that uh, is is very uh, clear to me, and it is part of the the heavy responsibility all decision makers uh, make right now is that these are not simple equations. Uh, we are taking steps to suppress the harm of the virus, but the steps we are taking to do that are causing other harms. So if you put forward an argument that says either we should have locked down earlier or, you know, as I am right now, we should be very cautious about lifting it, we've got to be prepared to assess all of that in the round because these things will create harms of their own. So these are complex judgments. I am satisfied that we have made the best decisions that we can um, in the, uh, the way that we can, but there will always be uh, very legitimate scrutiny of those as we learn lessons for the future. You, you asked me one further point, which I'll address before handing over to Gregor, about the powers. I, I don't stand here trying to uh, pass my responsibility on to anybody else. I stand here every day because I recognise the responsibility I have as First Minister in the Scottish Government to take the best decisions I can to protect the people of Scotland. In practical terms, of course, as you know, we'll hear the Chancellor today talk about uh, the furlough scheme and, and hopefully we'll hear an extension of that. Uh, because of the split of devolved and reserved responsibilities, of course, um, there are issues that we are relying on the UK government uh, taking decisions on in order to make sure that we have the right uh, array of support in place. And it's also, as I've, I've said all along, that while we have to take decisions appropriate for our own circumstances, and that is particularly true as we come out of, of this lockdown, um, 
this virus doesn't respect borders and boundaries, so we have to continue to work together in as collaborative a way as possible. Uh, Gregor, do you want to add anything? So, so I think it's impossible to find yourself in, uh, in the centre of a situation, as, as we all find ourselves just now, without um, having cause to reflect at times on, on uh, your experience during that and um, different points in time, decisions, evidence as it emerges. Because it's been a rapidly changing picture over the last um, three months, short months that we've been dealing with uh, this coronavirus. I, I think the point that I would make is, is that there are very um, recognised scientific structures that were producing the evidence that have been used to form these decisions in, in, in the UK. And, and had that evidence been coming simply from one source, um, the, the, then um, I, I think it would have given cause for doubt, but multiple scientific groups, multiple research groups were feeding into that process and, and each of them contributing and, and providing advice which was very similar. And, and it's, it's the consensus of that scientific advice that, um, that is then available for people to make decisions on. So I think that the evidence that was available at the points in time was, was the evidence that was available in order that you could base those decisions on. From Thank you, First Minister. The Chancellor has just announced the furlough scheme is to be extended until the end of October. The Finance and Economy Secretaries wrote to the Chancellor last week asking that workers aren't penalised by the lockdown being eased at a different pace here. How important is it that any changes to the furlough scheme reflect the fact that workers here may be off longer than elsewhere in the UK? And what assurances have you had on that? Well, these are, as I've said a, a few times uh, standing here, these are ongoing discussions uh, with the Treasury uh, and you know, other matters will be uh, ongoing, covered by ongoing discussions with other parts of the UK government. I I haven't seen the detail of, of that announcement yet, but from what you've said there, I, I certainly welcome uh, that extension. We've been very clear that there has to be support in place for as long as we are asking businesses not to operate as, as normal, and we have to avoid cliff edges. We also, yes, and um, I noticed uh, and, and welcomed the fact that the UK government's publication yesterday was very explicit in saying that uh, people in the different nations of the UK had to follow the guidance that uh, the governments in different parts of the UK were giving. So uh, if there are uh, instances of us moving at different speeds because the evidence says that is necessary, then these support structures have to reflect that. That said, as I also reflected yesterday, you know, we, we are talking here about moving at slightly different speeds. I don't think anybody, um, certainly not me at this stage, is contemplating or, or predicting that Scottish businesses will be unable to operate for long periods of time uh, differently to the situation elsewhere in the UK. We want to get businesses able to operate as quickly as possible, but I'm absolutely clear that that must be safe. And that, must, that means uh, you know, two things. Firstly, that we are confident about the suppression of the virus. And secondly, that when we are asking people to come back to work, that the arrangements in their workplaces are safe for them to operate in. And of course, for the foreseeable future, we will be encouraging as many people as possible to work from home. Uh, but for those, and, and, and you know, there are particular occupations where it is difficult to work from home, and we don't want you know, people who are in jobs that are able to organise their working life to work at home to, to almost... Uh, you know, by default, be safer than those who have to go to a workplace. We want to make workplaces safe as well. And I think it's really important we take those steps in a very careful and considered way. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. We learned last night on BBC Scotland's disclosure that COVID was in Edinburgh in late February at a, a Nike conference. Why weren't the public told then? Um, on the, the Nike event, I, I was satisfied then and I'm satisfied now that all appropriate steps were taken. Can I just be clear on, on one point and then um, answer the question more substantively? There is a suggestion, and I think it may be implicit in your question, that there was knowledge of that outbreak while that conference was, was happening. That is not the case. The knowledge that there were cases associated with that event uh, transpired when the cases that were then associated with that event began to be confirmed and reported uh, through the Scottish reporting system. And all of the cases uh, associated with that event of people in Scotland were reported through our normal daily uh, figures uh, that are still being reported uh, now. 
And uh, what then happened, uh, Health Protection Scotland established an incident management team. Uh, all appropriate contact tracing was done. So all appropriate steps were taken in order to ensure that public health was being protected. And had there been more information about that event put into the public domain at that time, that would not have changed the steps that were taken to protect public health. Uh, at the time, I probed uh, whether we should be putting uh, more information into to the public domain. Uh, the, the advice, which is advice uh, I accepted, that, that was not appropriate. Uh, one of the reasons for that was patient confidentiality at a time when the numbers of cases remained as low as they were to identify where any case contracted the virus could potentially have identified uh, the patient's concern. So, you know, that's the, the the, the process that was gone through there, the, the most important thing is that all appropriate steps were taken there to make sure that the wider uh, issues of public health were properly dealt with and that public health was properly protected. Uh, Peter Smith from ITV News. Just First Minister, thank you. Just to follow up on that, um, what you're saying there suggests that you put the confidentiality of the people at that conference over uh, public health. I mean, I myself actually stayed at that hotel where the conference was held a week later. Had I known, I might have made a different choice, as with many other people. But my question is, um, given that we've also seen in that BBC Disclosure documentary that more and more respected scientists across the UK were actually advising you against abandoning the contact tracing, and even you were written to at that time, um, you say that you've followed the science throughout of this. The question is, why did you ignore that science and what science was guiding you uh, throughout February and March before your own advisory group was set up? Um, can I say firstly, just on, on the first part of your question, you completely mischaracterise uh, what I said there. I didn't say that we put patient confidentiality ahead of public health. Um, both of those things are important. I, I, I cannot uh, simply uh, disregard issues of patient confidentiality. Um, but what I said and what I started my answer by stressing is that all appropriate steps were taken, all necessary steps were taken to protect public health. So the suggestion that public health was not a priority is absolutely not the case. And I, and I think uh, that has to be stressed. So the incident management team, contact tracing, uh, making sure that any steps to... to uh, ensure there was no onward transmission into to the community. All of that was done as it would have been necessary. Um, and there would have been uh, no risk to anybody staying in that hotel. Incidentally, I didn't know the venue of the, the conference at the time, um, but there would have been no risk to anybody staying in that hotel uh, a week uh, later because all of the steps were taken. But patient confidentiality is important. When you have small numbers of cases, uh, you know, particularly for events where delegate lists presumably might have been available to, to say that cases were associated with a particular event, you do run the risk of identifying people. And you know that is not something that is simply disregarded, but it is not the case that public health was not given the uh, priority that it should have had. Um, in terms of your wider point, we, we've, we set out not just subsequently, but at the time, the different stages we would go through and uh, the move from the contain phase into the delay phase, which moved from uh, moved us into a different approach to testing. In parallel to that, we were uh, rapidly and substantially increasing our testing capacity. I, you know, I, I don't say this disrespectfully at all because I, I respect many of these voices that are, are giving their opinion right now and you, we should listen to all opinion, but, but lots of people write to me with different opinions on a whole range of things. I'm not saying those opinions are not important, but I have, as Gregor said earlier on, I have established... Uh, ways of taking advice, of weighing that advice, and being the one that then applies my judgment to that and making decisions. So, you know, there will be not just now, um, but for rightly for some time to come, scrutiny of decisions governments the world over have taken on this. Uh, but, you know, I don't have the benefit of applying 2020 hindsight. I've got to take decisions based on the evidence uh, and the advice I have just now, applying my own judgment and taking the responsibility of making the decisions and continuing to, as we go, learn lessons, but also continuing to stay focused on the decisions that lie ahead. We are, I keep stressing this point, we are not through this pandemic yet. And while it is legitimate to look backwards, if I was to spend all my time right now looking backwards, I would take my eye off the ball of the steps that lie ahead. And that is absolutely something I must not do because the steps that lie ahead are crucial uh, to our ability to get out of this lockdown, to get back to normality without risking 
a further spike in this virus that will cause more people to die. Uh, Peter McMahon, ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, you had a very strong message there to employers, urging them not to put pressure on their employees, their workers, to go back to work prematurely. I wonder, would you deliver the same message to employers south of the border, say in and around Carlisle, to workers who currently live in Scotland? Uh, yes, unequivocally. And uh, my, my message uh, applied to all employers, clearly employing people who work in Scotland. I, I would hope all employers across the UK would be responsible. But my uh, responsibility, of course, is for is for those who, who live in uh, Scotland. So I would say to employers, wherever your head office is, wherever you are based, if you are employing people who live in Scotland, have regard to the Scottish Government guidance. Indeed, that is what the UK Government would tell you to do as well. We are going through a process uh, that will allow us, in, at the right time and in the right phasing, to give people the confidence that they can go back to work safely. Um, I mentioned the 14 working groups we have working already sector by sector. We all want to see businesses able to operate as close to normal as possible, as soon as possible, but I will not act in a way that compromises the safety of workers. And, and I will not ask workers to go back, even if I don't think their safety has been compromised, unless I can persuade them that they are going to be safe at their workplace, because I think we owe it to people, given the, the quite traumatic uh, circumstances that people are, are going through right now, that we assure people that when they go to work or when they send their kids to school, they are as safe as it is possible uh, for them to be. Not everybody has the, the luxury, not, I know people working at home right now will not necessarily feel it is a luxury, so I don't mean to, to minimise at all uh, the pressures everybody's under right now. What I should have said is it's not an option for everybody to work for homes. So if we are going to ask people to go back into workplaces, it is absolutely incumbent on us to do everything we can to give them the assurance that it is safe. And I would ask businesses uh, to work with us as the vast majority are in order to achieve that as soon as possible. Uh, Kieran Jenkins from Channel 4. Good afternoon, First Minister. We now have figures for week 18 in England and Wales, as well as Scotland. Can you explain why the percentage of deaths in care homes is so much higher in Scotland? Um, I can't explain, I, I don't mean that in a, a pejorative way, I, I can't speak for England's figures. Um, I can speak for Scotland's figures. We will have uh, the, the, the up-to-date figures tomorrow uh, for Scotland, which uh, we publish figures a, a week more up-to-date uh, than is the case in England, um, and last week, although uh, we saw the percentage of overall deaths in the the, the previous week in care homes uh, rise, the number of deaths in care homes had started to decline, and I don't know what tomorrow's figures will show, but I very much hope that we continue to see that trend. What I would say um, is that the figures that we are reporting in Scotland uh, do not appear to be out of step with international comparisons in terms of care homes. There are many countries that are uh, reporting that the percentage of deaths happening in care homes is similar to the, the percentage that we are reporting here in Scotland. So all I can say is that I am satisfied the figures we are reporting in Scotland are robust and I cannot then comment on the figures uh, in England. That would be for ONS or uh, UK government uh, ministers to do. Gregor, do you want to add to that? So, so I think the thing I would emphasise here is we can only speak for the, the kind of type of patients that we know exist with, within our Scottish care home system and, and, and we know the, 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 the relative group of ages that, that, that they come from and, and also the, the, the heavy burden of disease that they already carry. Um, uh, be, because of the number of um, comorbidities that they have with them. And, and making comparisons with other parts of the country or even internationally then becomes very difficult because often you find in care home populations there's very, very different types of, 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 of cases that you have in different types of, of homes as well. So I, I don't think I would want to be drawn into that. What I can say with confidence is that the way that the Scottish system is um, understanding what is happening in care homes is is, is, is with the, the, the use of really robust reporting data, both through the way that we um, report um, the, the unfortunate deaths that are in the system, but also through the care inspector and the way that they receive information from individual care homes as well. There's one further point I would add, which is from the, the, the week where we can 
compare. Obviously, as I say, we'll get uh, a week more up to date figures for Scotland tomorrow. And I, you know, I hesitate before I say this because I, you know, all of these deaths are tragic, and talking about comparisons between countries is important. But it, I, I don't want it to. Uh, take away from the fact that I don't think any level uh, of death from this virus is acceptable. But when we look at the, the total excess mortality, you, there have been a higher number of deaths overall in recent weeks than the, the normal average. We see that rise in mortality uh, slightly lower in Scotland than it has been in other parts of the UK. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something now that I probably shouldn't do because it is speculating perhaps it is that more of the excess uh, mortality is being attributed to care homes in Scotland than it is elsewhere in the UK. But, but when we see the, the overall uh, numbers of deaths and the excess part of that, that rise has actually been lower in Scotland than it has been in England. Uh, can I go now to James Shaw from BBC Network? Thank you, First Minister. Um, you said a moment ago that you probed the advice that you were given that the outbreak at that Nike conference shouldn't be made public. Can, can you say what the basis was of the concerns that, that you had? Um, and also a question for the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, are you comfortable that the advice that was given to the First Minister at that time uh, was correct? Um, I, when, when I say I probed it, I asked a question because, you know, that's sometimes my job. It's to say, look, should we be saying this or, or that? You know, that's... Uh, that's not to say I was profoundly concerned uh, about it or, or anything like that. Uh, but when we, we had a, a couple of cases, uh, I think in the first instance, associated with one event, it's not a, a surprising question for me to say, you know, should we say what this event is? And then I accepted the advice about the reason why that was not appropriate. But the most important thing for me was where all of the right steps being taken to investigate that, to contact trace and to ensure that the risk to public health in terms of onward transmission uh, were being properly mitigated. And as I said, I was satisfied of that then and I am satisfied of that now. Gregor. So, so um, I am very comfortable with the way that that incident was managed. Um, and, and I think that the appropriate steps were overseen by Health Protection Scotland uh, in a way that, that was, was fair to, to everyone and actually balanced where the, the, the risks lay. I, I have to say that I, I wasn't directly involved in providing the advice to the First Minister at that point, but having um, examined the advice, I, I, I understand entirely the reasons why it was given. Okay, uh, Lindsay uh, Hannah from Burr. Thanks, First Minister. There are calls today from the Scottish Conservatives for the Scottish Government to restart some cancer services, which were suspended, particularly some of the screening programmes. Do you have an update on where your plan is? How do you plan to get through the backlog, and do you have a timescale for this? Uh, that is, as I've said before, you know, I, I'd already. It said we are working uh, on restoring and resuming uh, postponed NHS procedures that would include uh, the cancer screening services that is work that is underway right now in order to make sure we can do that safely and we will give updates on that uh, as soon as we can uh, as part of our overall approach to getting uh, things back to normal but getting uh, particularly uh, procedures where uh, there are uh, cancer cases where the the judgment right now is the risk of going ahead is, is greater than the risk of postponing. We want to get those who have active symptoms right now back into having uh, their uh, procedures done. And obviously cancer screening, uh, which is screening people who are not necessarily showing symptoms, but going for routine screening. Uh, we want to get that back as quickly as possible. So we'll continue to update on progress with that as regularly as we can. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. First Minister, I, I respect that you've not seen the, the full details of the furlough extension scheme as of yet, but on the basis that that's been extended by four months, how confident are you that that will be enough to keep businesses closed who, to say the least, are eager to get back to work? And as we see some UK chains planning to reopen stores in Scotland, so McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, what's your view on, on those reopening just now when the lockdown is still very much in play? Uh, well, I've made my views on that latter point uh, known and I'm happy to do so again. Uh, right now, for the reasons I've set out, because our progress against this virus is fragile, we must be cautious. Uh, we must not prematurely uh, lift these restrictions and risk the virus running out of control. Or, you know, before too long, it won't just be 
questions about should we or should we not have gone into lockdown more quickly, uh, it will be why did you lift lockdown uh, earlier? So I, I make no apology for being cautious about this. And I would say to employers um, of all shapes and sizes in all sectors um, that you should be following in Scotland uh, Scottish Government advice. We are not yet encouraging any businesses that are not open right now or any workers who are not working right now to be back in operation. Of course, that will change in the weeks ahead and we want to get back to as close to normal operation for businesses as quickly as possible, but that has to be done safely and it has to be done in the right order. So as I said earlier on, we can give workers that we are asking to go back into workplaces confidence that they are as safe as they can be. And I think every worker across the country has every right uh, to expect that uh, and trade unions on their behalf have every right uh, to expect that as well. Um, on the furlough scheme I will um, I think be cautious about saying too much about it because I haven't seen the detail of it except I think a, an extension to October is welcome. Um, I think that uh, hopefully uh, with the caveat that I've not seen the detail yet, but on the face of it, that should avoid cliff edges where companies have to start redundancy processes because they're worried about the furlough scheme coming to an end uh, within the time scale that they have to consult around redundancy. So it gives companies, I think, more time uh, to do that. And hopefully over that period, we are able to see the further suppression of the virus and that, albeit gradual and perhaps relatively slow, restart of the economy. So from what I uh, have been able to gather from your questions uh, so far, I think the Chancellor's announcement is, is welcome, but uh, I will wait and see the detail before commenting any further on it. Uh, Neil Puran from PA. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, on the contact tracing app being developed by NHSX, I know in the past you've said uh, you need to be convinced that A, this app works, and B, that it's secure before you recommend its use uh, in Scotland. Uh, Matt Hancock is uh, probably going to announce this will be rolled out in England in the coming days. Uh, have there been any further discussions around this app, how it would work in Scotland, and are you convinced that it's met those tests yet? Um, those, there have been further discussions, Scottish uh, government teams have been able to uh, understand a little bit more about it, but that is ongoing. Uh, the app has been trialled right now in uh, the Isle of Wight, and we obviously will look with interest at the, the outcome of that trial. I heard Matt Hancock uh, this morning. But there are still questions we have. I, I should say, and I've said before, I, I, I hope that we will be in a position where this app is, is a positive benefit. We're not building our system here in Scotland uh, on the foundation of a proximity app. Uh, we're, we're building it in a more traditional uh, sort of bottom-up way, but a proximity app may well be a useful enhancement to it. I, I suppose there are three things uh, we're trying to understand uh, more, just fundamentally how the app works. Secondly, how it will integrate with our NHS systems here. Um, and thirdly, to make sure we can give uh, the confidence uh, to people about the privacy and security of it. Because if we don't do that, that, that's not to say that I have concerns about the privacy and security, but if we don't convince, about, like try to convince people to go back to work, if, if we don't uh, address any concerns at the outset, we won't be successful in persuading people to uh, use it. So we're, we're working through uh, all of these things and uh, we'll, we'll look to see the outcome of the trial. Do you want to say any more on that? Or? No. no? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Rachel Watson from the Mail. Um, First Minister, can I just go back to the Nike outbreak? You have today been accused of a cover-up over this. Can you tell us when exactly you found out about the outbreak? And also, you say you didn't disclose this because of patient confidentiality, but was there no way that you could have said that there was a case in Lothian or that there had been some kind of conference where the virus had been linked to? Um, and then I'm sure you would have been saying, why aren't you telling us what that event is? Look, these are, uh, are, are not always straightforward, simple judgments. Uh, on the accusation of a cover-up, that is complete and utter nonsense. Why would we have been trying to cover anything up? This was, uh, we were reporting uh, figures on this. I've stood up here every single day to be as open and transparent with you, the public, 
as possible. There is no interest in covering these things up. So that is is nonsense. And actually, I, I don't know where that accusation comes from, but it sounds like highly politicised uh, nonsense uh, as well. Um, in terms of when I knew, as I said in early March, I think it was around the 2nd or 3rd of March, that the, the first cases uh, identified with that event started to be confirmed as, as positive. As I said, I, I didn't know uh, what the venue was. I'm not even sure I, I, I knew what the venue was until it, it was reported uh, in, in this programme. But the, the most important thing is that all appropriate steps are taken to uh, investigate an outbreak, to contact trace and to protect wider public health. And I, as I said before, I was satisfied then and I am satisfied now that all of those appropriate steps were taken. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thank you very much, First Minister. Just on that point, um, the BBC had said one of the delegates from abroad brought the virus into Edinburgh. It sounds like from your answer to Rachel's question that you're confirming that is the case. I just want to make sure it absolutely is. But also on the um, inf uh, informing of the public, you were able to say and we were told that the first person to be confirmed with the virus in Scotland was a patient in Tayside who travelled back from northern it Italy. If you're able to say that, why were we not able to be told about a group of people who appear to have brought the virus into the country at a conference in Edinburgh? Because Tayside is... I, I, sorry, I don't mean to, to be flippant or, or make light of this because these are important issues, but Tayside is a big place and lots of people from Tayside potentially would have been in, in Italy. So to try to identify somebody from that information would be very difficult for a conference that, as, as I understand, it had 70 people in total at and a small number of the identified cases were in Scotland. That is clearly the, the, the risk of identification is is much uh, greater uh, there. Um, in terms of, I'm, I'm just trying to. In terms of your, your point about bringing into Edinburgh, I, I think are you saying those cases were the first in Edinburgh identified? And I think uh, that will be the case, but we'll, we'll double check that. Um, and if I've got that wrong, I will, will clarify it. But the the case in Tayside was the first uh, reported, uh, confirmed, and reported case in Scotland. Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Um, just following up on that, uh, the Scottish Government was informed about the incident that a patient, uh, that a case had been discovered at the conference on March the 2nd. The following day, Jean Freeman gave an update to the Scottish Parliament in which she spoke about the Tayside case and patient confidentiality, meaning no more details could be provided, but about the contact tracing that was going on. I'm not clear why you couldn't have just, just said there was a case in Lothian without linking it to the conference, given exactly the same process was going on in terms of contact tracing. So we had one case where in Tayside where, and one case in Lothian where similar processes were, were being undergone, but only one was the public were told about. I'm not, again, my apologies if I'm not understanding your question properly, but the, the cases were reported in exactly the same way as the, the Tayside case, so they were reported through the, the normal uh, system. The, the, the thing that wasn't said is that there were a number of cases associated with one event, but these cases were all uh, reported through our reporting system, which of course is still going today because it's the basis of the figures uh, I report here at the, the briefing on a daily basis. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I want to ask you about the test rates and isolate policy. Experts around the world, and indeed here in Scotland, have repeatedly highlighted the importance of carrying out large numbers of tests locally and having results available as quickly as possible. Our own testing still remains well below capacity, and I think by most recent accounts, turnaround time currently sits around 30 hours, while other countries are able to do it in four. Why haven't we been able to keep pace with what is being done now to improve that record? Um, we... So test, trace and isolate is obviously is all testing, but this is a, a, a different strand to our testing work than, than current testing. Uh, as it happens, as I do regularly uh, on a weekly basis right now, but yesterday afternoon I uh, was talking in depth with uh, the team working on this. So there's a number of things that we are uh, working on at pace and building up rapidly the testing capacity beyond where we are right now contact tracers so you know I, I retweeted this myself this morning there's an advert live uh, for people to apply for jobs as contact tracers so we're building that capacity as well and you're absolutely right to talk about the importance when you're testing to then potentially contact trace the turnaround time 
of tests being very important. So a part of that discussion is how do we, working with our labs, both our NHS labs and the academic labs that we uh, are also working in partnership with, how do we not just get the time, uh, turnaround time for the, the, the processing of the test as short as possible, but the whole journey from a patient phoning up to say, or, or entering their details online to say they've got symptoms through to a test result, how do we get that uh, as short as possible as well? So that is all absolutely part of the work that we are doing just now to make sure we've got a test trace isolate system uh, that is fit for purpose. And we are taking the advice of the expert advisory group on that uh, as we proceed. Do you want to add anything on test trace isolate? No, I don't think mm -hmm. so. Uh, first Minister, rather than to, to reinforce the, the importance that we're we'll placing on looking at the workforce, looking at a uh, personalising it, looking at rapidly supporting the communities that we have to make sure that we do that as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And make, we're making these preparations uh, right as we speak. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thanks, First Minister. Um, can I just go back to um, this issue around this um, Edinburgh outbreak in March? Um, obviously, you've um, committed to be as transparent and, and open as possible with the public, but given that you know the public weren't informed of this, hasn't that been undermined in this, this case? Um, I don't think so, because um, I've, I've tried to set out the reasons. Well, firstly, the steps that were taken, which is about protecting public health, and also the reasons why more information wasn't given at the time. And, and the public can draw their own conclusions. I've been very clear all along that transparency involves me being uh, as open with as much information as possible. But in this context, sometimes being frank about what I can't say, sometimes for reasons like those I'm given today and sometimes because this is a, a developing situation, we don't always have all of the answers. So standing up here every day, reporting directly to the people of, of, of Scotland, it, answering questions, hearing me being probed on all of these things, that is all part of, of that transparency. The outbreak, uh, uh, the, the uh, Nike event, I've set out the steps that were taken there and the reasons why it's, we, we did things the way we did. People can draw their own conclusions from that. I, I understand that. But please, um, I said at the outset of this, not just that I would be as transparent as possible, but that I would admit to making mistakes. I, I don't think that is the case here. Uh, but other people may have a different judgment. You know, we are all working through a, an unprecedented situation, trying to get it as right as possible at every step. I think we did get it right here, um, but people can uh, make their own judgment by hearing uh, the the, the explanation that I'm setting out. Uh, Libby Brooks from The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. Um, could I ask you about Inverclyde, please? The NRS figures showed last week that uh, Inverclyde local authority is the highest COVID-19 death rate in the country, but locals are still concerned that they don't have a detailed enough data on infections and deaths, uh, nor widespread enough testing to identify how the virus is spreading. And I just wanted to ask whether there will be more localised data and testings for local authorities if they find themselves in similar positions, and also whether you have any sense of, of why this spike has occurred. I had over to Gregor on uh, the uh, granularity of the data, because we want that to be as detailed as possible, and that is an ongoing uh, process where... Uh, NRS, HPS are working to, to provide as much detail as, as they can. Uh, let me just briefly talk about uh, the issue in general and then also very briefly about testing. Uh, I'll start with that actually. We uh, also have access now to mobile testing facilities and uh, certainly where we think there is a need it is open to us to try to direct that to a particular area and we would certainly uh, always be happy to discuss with local areas uh, where there is a, a, a need for that or a perceived need for that. On the, 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 the numbers in Inverclyde and again I'm not underplaying this at all because we have to look very seriously at all of this but it's a bit like international comparisons they are important they're legitimate um, but we are not through this pandemic yet so what might look right now as one part of Scotland having a higher number of deaths than another uh, hopefully we will see all deaths uh, decline but by the end of this outbreak may not look exactly like that so I would just caution um, of course, we have to look at these things as we go along, but we also have to recognise that, unfortunately, we have still got a way to go through this epidemic and, and we have to, uh, I think, resist drawing definitive conclusions right now about the, the variable impacts of it.
Gregor Johnson, say a bit more. So, so just to pick up on that point, I mean, I think I would characterise this just now as, as we're, we're kind of um, early in the first half still in, in terms of where we are in terms of managing this, this epidemic, there's a lot more understanding yet to come, there's a lot more data yet to come, and, and, and whether that be Inverclyde or any other area of Scotland, we'll continually look to see how we can develop that data to provide a much better, deeper understanding of exactly how um, this, this disease is affecting those communities. But we do know a lot already about the types of communities where this uh, virus particularly can, can, can have uh, quite an impact, and, and those tend to be communities where there is already a high burden of, of, of illness within the, the people who live there, who have particularly um, older age groups who, who, who may be predominant there, and who tend to live closer together. And, and there are some of our communities where, where we see those features feature much, much more readily than others. And, and, and I suspect that when in the future we look back and, and, and we do the, the, the kind of deeper analysis, we, we will see that some of our communities that are more likely to experience deprivation will be particularly affected for all those factors um, that, that, that I've outlined there, and, and particularly because of that burden of disease that many of these communities have within them as well. Thank you. Um, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. First Minister, um, on resuming um, NHS services, no routine dentistry has been carried out in Scotland as a result of um, lockdown, and it's leaving a growing number of people in pain and discomfort. The, the only treatment, I believe, is either multiple courses of antibiotics or sometimes needless um, extractions. Can you tell us what plans are in place to get dental practices uh, reopen again? Well, that is all part of the consideration that is underway, and obviously we will uh, talk to uh, the dental profession as we go about that. Gregor, do you want to say more uh, about dentistry? Yeah, I mean, w one of the things we've got to make sure is that, is that whether it's um, for, for any aspect of clinical care, whether it be dentistry, optometry or, or, or whatever, is that we're taking an approach that manages the risk appropriately. And that's the risk both for the individuals who's seeking care, but also for those who are delivering care as well. And dental's no different from that. And part of the plans that we're beginning to develop um, around about how we, we kind of restart and prioritise services as we do that, so that we can do that in a safe sense, um, includes very much dentistry, and particularly that urgent need to address some of the, the, the kind of more symptomatic uh, causes uh, that, that people would go and see the dentist about. Okay, thanks. Uh, Alistair Grant from The Herald. Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, given the information and the comments from other experts uh, that were aired in the BBC Disclosure Programme last night, uh, as well as the scientific debate in the media over the previous days and weeks, uh, will the Scottish Government publish the scientific advice it is basing and has based its decisions on uh, in the interest of full transparency and so the public can understand why those decisions were made? Well, we, we, you know, the, the papers we've published so far goes into a lot of the, uh, the data that we're basing our decisions on, the expert advisory group that has now been set up in Scotland, which you know, I've explained before the, the reasons we thought it was important to set that up to complement um, and make more specific to Scotland uh, the advice that was uh, being given. They publish uh, their uh, minutes on our website already. The, the membership of that is known. So we will continue to be as, as open and transparent as we can be around not just the decisions we're taking, but the basis of those decisions. I think, you know, I'm not a scientist, although I've probably learned more about science in the last uh, few weeks than, than I uh, ever have uh, before. Um, but there will always be differences of opinion. Science is not absolute. There is no, you know, right science and wrong science sometimes, I mean, sometimes there is, of course, but uh, there will always be debates about uh, these things. And it's important that we listen to different opinions, but ultimately we have to make the best judgments and decisions we can uh, based on the best advice and the best evidence that, that we have. So uh, that's what we'll continue to do and be as open along the way about that. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, we heard the Chief Medical Officer say again this morning that the health service remains open. However, a gentleman I spoke to this morning paints a different picture. The man whose details I passed to your office earlier this morning, First Minister, has a brain tumour. He started on a year-long course of chemotherapy in January, but when he went to begin April's, he was told that the treatment which had kept his tumour stable was not going to be going ahead because of coronavirus. Now, it could be that there was a genuine clinical reason for this um, concerning the immune system and the increased risk of um, contracting the virus. However, he was told to return in July, meaning three months of treatment had been missed. 
And more importantly, he will not see um, medical professionals for the same amount of time. And someone in such a vulnerable position needs that reassurance. I'm sure he's not alone. So what is the Scottish Government doing to help these str those struggling with concerns and anxiety about existing medical uh, problems? And should more clinics be in operation during this period to carry out more regular scans for cancer patients like him? Uh, well, thanks, Vivian. And firstly, can I say thank you for passing the details of the, the individual launches this morning? I, obviously, I, I can't go into the details of individual patient cases, but we will look into that and, and we'll contact uh, the, the individual concerned to see what further uh, help and support and advice we can give. Uh, I'm not a clinician, so equally I can't comment on the clinical advice that has been given, but I think you possibly alluded in your question to perhaps some of the considerations that were at play, um, or, or maybe at play generally with some of these cases about the risks of going ahead because of immune uh, compromised systems may be greater than, than the risks of, of not. But it is really important that people firstly get support and advice, but also that we get these kinds of procedures resumed as, as early as possible. And that is what is uh, that work is underway right now. I'll, I'll let Gregor say a word about that, but just to reassure you that we will uh, look into the specific case that you have uh, sent the details off to us. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I have real sympathy for people and their families who are experiencing this, this hiatus in their investigation and, and, and their care. And, and I know that the decisions that relate to those have been taken um, very, very carefully. They've been carefully risk assessed by clinicians who are looking after them just to make sure um, that, that, that actually the, the, the best approach is, um, is taken. The truth of it is, is sometimes it is far too risky to go forward with either a treatment or an investigation plan uh, because of the risks that that might pose to the individual in terms of um, their exposure to um, the harms that we know coronavirus causes. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult balance between recognising the, the, the direct harms that COVID might cause in those circumstances and the, the, both the, the kind of concern and, and, and any indirect harms that it might cause by any delays to treatment. So, so these are very finely judged clinicians, but I would want to reassure people that they're, that they're, that they're, they're led by clinical decision making, that those risks are, are carefully managed, and that we make sure that we restart those treatments as, as one of the priority areas um, once we begin to scale up the, the responses in the NHS as a whole. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Fiona to say our too, from a nursing perspective and how important it is to make sure we get these operations back on track? I think it is important, and clearly the, the First Minister and, and Dr Smith have talked about the, this individual patient, but what we would encourage people, we've got specialist nurses who are available to support people, obviously GP surgeries, so we, we don't want people to be fretting and not contacting the, the health service because there may well be other ways that we can support people, but equally there may well be explanations for people to be had that can, can be helped. So we would encourage people to access the, the NHS and, and look at that. And as I say, there are, there are many ways, whether it's district nursing or specialist nursing, that, that people can be helped and supported. Okay, thanks, Fiona. And the last question today, uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thanks, First Minister. Um, it was just to follow up on Derek's question about testing. Um, the most recent daily figures show that less than half of Scotland's capacity uh, was used. Can you explain why uh, this capacity is still not being utilised? Um, I'm not sure which figures you're looking at. This is not a criticism, but remember, just remember if it's uh, there is an NHS capacity and then there's a lighthouse capacity, but also in terms of usage, uh, we, we have those who go through the drive-through centres uh, as well as the those who go through NHS labs. So it's, it's important that we look at the totality of that. There will always, and I've explained this before, uh, be a mismatch between capacity and usage for, for good reasons because of the, the variation in demand. Uh, we are also... Uh, potentially uh, seeing a, a decline in community transmission of, of the virus. So, you know, some groups who were perhaps uh, experiencing symptoms and coming forward for, for testing, perhaps in key workers, maybe there is uh, less demand there now, but we are increasing it in other areas like in, in care homes. So there is a daily, uh, daily uh, effort to make sure that everybody who requires testing is tested and that we use that uh, capacity as fully as is necessary to use it. The build-up of capacity, though, is 
you know, we, we need to have capacity growing and therefore we may have capacity at the moment that is, is growing faster than, than our demand because we are building towards a test trace isolate system which will need more capacity uh, than uh, we are, are using right now. We have said in the TTI paper we published uh, a week or so ago that our initial aim is to get uh, capacity up to 15,500. Uh, we will inevitably take it beyond that. So, so our capacity will be growing over the next period to meet that uh, future demand for uh, TTI, even if it is not capacity that has been fully uh, used right now. The important right now is we're testing everybody who needs tested for a clinical uh, reason. That's why I mentioned earlier on in, in context of hospital uh, cases, the over 70 hospital admissions, whether they've got symptoms or not, the uh, testing of all uh, residents and staff in care homes where there's an outbreak, whether they've got symptoms or not, the surveillance testing that, that we are also doing. So we continue to make sure that the testing strategy right now is driven by those clinical priorities. Do either of you want to add to that? So, so I think I just want to emphasise again, I've said it on, on a number of occasions, but, but deciding to take a test or deciding to, to, to ask for a test for a clinician, it needs to uh, it needs to answer a clinical question. It needs to be able to um, to, to get to the bottom of uh, and, and to help a clinician decide what their next course of, of action from. That's the usefulness of a test. And what we're seeing at this stage is is that there are, has certainly been a gradual decline in the number of people who are presenting with symptoms that need tested in that sense. And the First Minister's point about how we build up capacity for the future is really, really important here because it's that capacity which is going to be able to take us forward into this next stage of the test, trace, isolate and support. And, and so I think that it's inevitable that for a period there will be a gap between that demand led by clinicians who decide that a test is necessary and what we need to make sure that that TTIS system is firmly in place. Okay, thank you, uh, Gregor. Uh, that brings us to the end of the questions today. Um, thank you to all of the journalists for joining us. Um, my thanks to Gregor, uh, Fiona and Yvonne, our sign language interpreter, for all of her help today. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us. Again, um, the advice remains, as you know, uh, but it remains important to stay at home except for essential purposes and to follow all of the appropriate rules when you are out of your home. We are... Uh, as I keep saying, seeing progress with this virus, but we must keep at it if we're to see that progress continue in the right direction. I uh, think, you know, much of what we've been talking about today um, around all of these legitimate questions about, you know, should we have done this or that differently in the past? You know, we, we act on the basis of the best uh, advice we've got and take the best decisions. But as I said, I think last week, I, I don't have hind don't the ability to apply hindsight I do have the ability right now to apply foresight and it is really important that we remain cautious right now in order to keep this virus on a downward trend. So please keep doing what we're asking because it is making a difference. So my, my thanks again to all of you. Um, tomorrow we will be uh, in a slightly different format. Uh, this session uh, will start uh, in the Scottish Parliament tomorrow at I think 20 past 12 uh, where I'll give a brief update and then take questions at a First Minister's question session from the opposition party leaders um, and we will be back here uh, at the same time of 12.30 on Thursday. So we'll see you from the Scottish Parliament tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you very much.